The proceeding was... Uh, order, order, and welcome to this first hearing of the Foreign Affairs Committee Overseas Territories Subcommittee. Uh, we're delighted today to be kicking off with the first hearing on the British Indian Overseas Territories, and this session is really looking at the strategic importance of the base on Diego Garcia to both the UK and its allies, uh, the impact of the ruling of the ICJ, and the legal position of the UK government over administration of the islands. Um, ahead of this hearing, we have met with a number of Chagossian communities and spent time listening to Chagossian voices, which had a real range range of views when it came to resettlement, consultation around negotiations uh, and support for their communities here in the UK. Um, but we're also very grateful for all the extensive written evidence we've received also from Chagossians around the world um, and we've noted those views. Today we are joined by two very eminent experts who we're delighted to be hearing from. If I can ask you both to kindly introduce yourselves. Good morning, my name is Dr. Walter Ladwig. I'm a senior lecturer in international relations in the Department of War Studies at King's College London. A substantial portion of my research focuses on the geopolitics and geostrategy of the Indian Ocean, the Indo-Pacific, and I've previously published several articles and book chapters about Diego Garcia. Please. Um, <clears throat> I'm David Snoxel. Uh, I've had a, a long involvement with the Chagos Islands and Chagos issues. Uh, going back to when I was first Deputy Commissioner of uh, Biot in the mid-90s, and then later on High Commissioner to Mauritius. Uh, since then, I've kept up my involvement, especially with the all-party parliamentary group on the Chagos Islands, stroke Biot, uh, which was established in 2008. And we've had 93 meetings to date. Well, thank you ever so much. Um, Dr. Labrick, if I may, can you just set the scene for us as to why Diego Garcia matters so much, but particularly what it allows the US to do that it would be unable to do if it lost ability to operate from Diego Garcia? It provides a strategic entry point in the heart of the Indian Ocean that bases one third of America's pre positioned um, military forces. So this basically allows the US Army or the US uh, Marine Corps to surge tanks and other heavy equipment to a contingency location. You can fly troops in, so it, it allows a sort of rapid deployment of forces. The airfield there supports long-range air operations, and so again, U.S. forces in some cases based in the United States have rooted through Diego Garcia or been based there, responded to contingencies in the Middle East and South Asia. It's important as a communication station, satellite monitoring, one of the main tracking stations for the GPS network is based there, and the central positioning allows naval forces to remain on station for much longer than they would otherwise. So the central location both supports uh, naval vessels traveling from the Middle East to the Pacific and back, and supports operations, anti-piracy operations that have taken place in the Horn of Africa. And the challenge would be, you know, without that central location, you have to distribute assets and you have to distribute resources in various other places. So Djibouti, Oman, potentially Southeast Asia, none of those uh, have the centrality of Diego Garcia. Um, and some of those have potential political challenges. Djibouti has allowed China to open a facility there. Um, you know, uh, actors within the Gulf have different relationships with Iran, so to speak. So there's political challenges that would come with, with a, kind of a change of status. And conversely for the UK, what would loss of Diego Garcia mean for the Indo-Pacific tilt? What would it mean for our operations and relationship with the base? Look, it, it gives a th an element to point to when we discuss um, the stakes that the UK has within the Indian Ocean, within the Indo-Pacific. Now, I don't think it's one that's sort of irreplaceable in the sense that when you look at the presence of so many Commonwealth countries and you look at the presence of so many historical relationships, particularly with Gulf countries on the western edge of the Indian Ocean, it's not irreplaceable, but it certainly is something that the UK can, can point to. And then again, I would also say that insofar as the Indian Indian Ocean is very important to the UK economically, uh, both because of uh, energy flows and trade flows. Having the US there playing the role that it does benefits British interests. Thank you very much. David, is anything you'd like to add to that? Well, if I could just uh, comment, I agree with Dr. Ladwig on nearly all he said. Uh, I would just point out there are 
The question that you put seems to me to be a rather theoretical one that is not likely to arise. Nobody is questioning uh, continuing American and British control over Diego Garcia and the base. That simply doesn't arise. Um, the, other, the other point I would make is, and this comes emanates from your paper, Dr. Ladwig, that in fact the interest for the UK is very, very much less than for the US. The UK has never run any military operations out of Diego Garcia. It's too far away. And or I saw that one paper claimed, for example, that uh, uh, Britain had stores and ammunition and fuel on Diego Garcia, the answer is the UK has never had that and couldn't afford to buy it off the Americans. Those are my only... Oh, and then one last comment. Um, uh, as far as Djibouti is concerned, there are up to 11 military facilities, and that includes, of course, France, the US, the UK, Germany, Italy, uh, Russia, China, and so on. So it's not a big deal that all these countries have bases uh, cheek by jowl with each other in Djibouti. That's very helpful. And then in terms, I mean, obviously we're also looking to future-proof, and I think it's quite interesting the discussion about whilst there may be no question at the moment about UK and US access, of course we cannot necessarily, well, the goal of this is to look at future-proofing. In, in terms of that then, in terms of the kind of merits and drawbacks of a, a sovereign base area agreement versus a leasing agreement, um, Dr Labwick, where, where do you sit on those two? So I, I think the key point is the fr exact phrase that you used, future-proofing, right? Because we're not talking about risks or challenges today or even tomorrow, but over the long horizon. And I just want to, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with what David's put in his submission. The relationship of the government of Mauritius with the United States is excellent. The relationship of the government of Mauritius with India is excellent. India wants the United States to remain present in um, Diego Garcia. So all of that looks very good from our immediate standpoint. The, the potential challenge when we look over a long enough time horizon is that low probability um, uh, events could come to the fore. And one can only look at the Maldives, where India had a long-standing positive relationship with the government. And then we saw parties come into power that were more favorable to, to China than India. And then this becomes domestically politicized. An opposition party comes in that's India first. And now we have a government just elected on an explicit India out policy. And this, unfortunately, has been replicated in other parts of South Asia. So a future-proofed agreement, that would be something to, that you'd want to, to hedge against. Now, the, the merits of a sovereign base arrangement versus the kind of lease that would lock that in, and I'm thinking about the example of the lease undergirding the U.S. naval facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which is basically breakable by agreement between the two parties or the U.S. abandoning the site. It has operational control in the hands of the United States while still recognizing Cuban sovereignty, the fact that that has held up after 65 years of communist rule might give you an example of a lease arrangement that yeah. would, would future-proof and would provide without necessarily going through this process of, of sovereignty transfer. But I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really speak to the ins and outs of those. No, that's very helpful. And David, then, what if we took the UK out of this and the US wanted to sign a lease of Mauritius? How, how do we get to a situation where essentially the US has the operational freedom freedom that it says is a necessity, but you also have essentially uh, Mauritius having effective sovereignty over Diego Garcia and the islands. Right. Well, I would actually now argue, I've given a lot of thought to this over the past 30 years, that the best solution really be, would be for the UK, which has no military interest in Diego Garcia, uh, to hand it over to the United States yeah. and allow the US to negotiate an agreement with Mauritius. Uh, we would escape uh, a, a lot of responsibilities. Um, we, 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 we would be passing them on to Mauritius and the United States. But uh, our budget uh, at the moment for buyout is up to 20 million a year. Now, when I was uh, dealing with the issue from the Foreign Office, it was 2 million a year. So that budget is going up exponentially all the time for a whole range of reasons. So there is really a, 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 an, an interest for um, the taxpayer not to continue paying that large sum of money and allow the United States to run it. Now, that's an idea only from me. It doesn't represent any of the participants' views, and I have no idea what they think about it, but I just wanted to mention that 
it's not only a sovereign base that could be a solution, but it's also a hand of, the, of Diego Garcia, the base. And one last point, we must make a distinction between Diego Garcia and the Outer Islands. The 56 Outer Islands, 130 miles away from the base, can be treated quite separately, and that's where you could do resettlement. Uh, and the, the United States has no problem whatsoever with resettlement on the Outer Islands, and um, I don't think we really have a problem of it either. Uh, before I hand over to Henry, Dr. Ladbrook, is there anything you want to add around the idea of the US negotiating a lease for Mauritius? Um, I, you know, I, I, again, I don't know the legal ins and outs of how that transfer would take place. Right now, the U.S. position is that, you know, we support and encourage the two parties to release an outcome that is both doing the right thing, but also putting this particularly important facility on a long-term solid basis. Essentially, the U.S. wants it put to bed, and they want some assurance and certainty. Henry. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, indeed. Uh, Dr. Ladwick, what evidence um, is there of Chinese uh, state activities in the Indian Ocean? What, what, what does the pattern of that look like? Sure, um, considerable. And China has definitely been putting more focus on the Indian Ocean over the last decade. And it's pretty easy to understand why when you look at their dependence on the energy flows trans transiting from the Gulf, and also the fact that this is the reverse flow is the way that manufactured goods from East Asia make their market to you know, Africa, the Middle East, and in some cases Europe. So interestingly, China is the only major power that has embassies in all six Indian Ocean island states. Uh, France doesn't, the UK doesn't, the US doesn't. Um, since 2008, China has begun sending its warships to take part in anti-piracy operations off the Gulf of Aden. After 2014, they started sending submarines along with this. I'm not really clear why you need submarines to fight pirates, but a lot of people do see these as sort of shakedown cruises and um, efforts to sort of develop a longer range power projection capability. Um, this has been accompanied by the deployment of a number of uh, oceanographic and hydrographic survey vessels that are linked to the, to the PLA. So there's been extensive surveying and mapping of undersea uh, floors, uh, which would facilitate <clears throat> subsurface warfare. Uh, we've discussed already the opening of China's first overseas base in Djibouti 2017, their first overseas presence. Um, amongst scholars who, you know, specialize in the Indian Ocean, I'm thinking of people like Darshana Brua of, of Carnegie, they would argue that it's only a matter of when, not if, China opens a second facility and the Western Indian Ocean is widely expected to be where that takes place. And then if we step from the military standpoint to the economic, of course, it won't surprise you to know that China is the number one trading partner for most Indian Ocean littoral states. But there's also been a real big push through the Belt and Road Initiative to, you know, development loans that lead to infrastructure. So you have major port projects in Pakistan, in Sri Lanka, you know, in Oman, in the UAE, in Djibouti, and then all down the African coast, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Mozambique. So the, the, the military and economic presence has expanded tremendously in the last 10 to 15 years. That, thank you very much. That's, that, that's very clear in terms of that um, significant Chinese presence uh, in the Indian Ocean. You mentioned uh, that it's the only uh, state to have uh, missions in all of the Indian Ocean countries. With regard uh, more specifically to the relationship between China and Mauritius, um, how would you characterize that? How um, involved uh, is China uh, with in Mauritius, whether that be through the Belt and Road Initiative or in other ways? Uh, and uh, how would you see that relationship developing um, between China uh, and Mauritius and what sort of access Mauritius might give to the Chinese? So let me just step back before I answer that specifically by talking about the Mauritius relationship with India, because it is, it is very close and it is a very important partnership. Since the mid-1980s, um, India, basically the, the Mauritian National Security Advisor is either a retired or serving Indian official. The governments are, are very close and, and Mauritian governments have been on record saying they would never take any actions that undercut um, Indian interests in the region. Um, that being said, on the economic front, uh, Mauritius has been the recipient of about $1.4 in Chinese development finance, um, about a billion of which is, is loans, mostly linked to the Belt and Road Initiative. That's about 12% of Mauritian GDP. 
Um, just to put that in context, Sri Lanka, which ended up turning over a port in an airport and at one point was the poster child for the sort of debt trap diplomacy, their exposure to Chinese development finance was about 22% of GDP. So Mauritius is not by any means in that category, but there is some exposure there. Um, there is also the fact that Mauritius was the first African country to sign a free trade agreement with China, and the kind of a lot of the expectation around that is Mauritius as a gateway to the rest of the continent so that goods and things would flow through there. So potentially this could become a very important component of the Mauritian economy. Um, so then this gets to this question, and, and you know, I'm going to speak as an academic very, very briefly, which say that we, we debate and argue this in international relations, right? At what point and in what circumstances does economic dependence lead to political compliance, right? Simply because you owe somebody debt, simply because they're a big trading partner doesn't mean they snap your fingers and, and you jump to and, and do everything they say. Um, but it is a risk. And so then going back to, to the chair's comments about future proofing, I think one of the things that needs to be taken very seriously in negotiations is developing an agreement and developing a settlement such that if there were a future government that were more inclined towards China, that where perhaps, again, domestically relations with China and India become politicized in Mauritius as they have in other countries, that the agreement would stand up in the face of that. So that's the kind of future proofing scenarios, although it seems very unlikely at present, we need to take them seriously enough as we plan for the long, long term. And um, just briefly, what sort of military um, involvement um, in terms of the Chinese and Mauritius uh, would, would you, um, it, it occurs right now and would you uh, potentially envisage? So I'm not aware of any right now and given the position of Mauritius with respect to India, um, you know, in the, in the near term, it's, uh, it, it's hard to see. I think um, alternative locations like the Comoros uh, look a lot more um, uh, vulnerable and or friendly, depending on your perspective, to kind of Chinese involvement. And Mr. Stocksell, if, if, if I may, um, following on uh, from that, the um, relationship between China and India, uh, how do you see that uh, developing uh, with regard uh, to uh, the Indian Ocean um, area, uh, and do you see that there could be future risks where obviously the relationship right now is very close between um, India uh, and Mauritius, but as we heard um, a few moments ago, um, the Maldives used to have a, used to have a close relationship um, with, with India. Do you, how, how do you see the dynamic of that um, developing? Yes, well, that's uh, a good question. Um, I think I would start by saying that I don't agree with uh, some of what you've said, uh, simply because your actual submission talks about the Chinese focus is not on the Indian Ocean, but in the South Pacific. It's, it's very clear what you say there, and I agree with that. It isn't at the moment in the Indian Ocean. Um, now, I've been dealing with Mauritian governments since about 2000, and uh, I've just been in Mauritius, and I uh, called on the president. I had an hour with the prime minister, with the cabinet secretary, with a negotiating team, with uh, Olivier Bonco and the Chagas Refugees Group, and so on. Now, the purpose of my visit was basically holiday, so um, uh, there was uh, no involvement of the government of Mauritius in who I saw or what I did. And my take on Mauritius is they are appalled and shocked by these uh, suggestions that uh, they uh, <coughs> want um, the islands in order to be able to hand over another island to China or even Diogasi. These are, these are quite shocking allegations and uh, they have no substance whatsoever in it in terms of the Mauritian government. Now, I do accept, uh, Henry, that uh, you, can't be, you can't, just because that's the position of the last five governments in Mauritius, that it will always remain that way. But that's really what the population think. Whoever I talked to, uh, whether it was in the economy, managers, hotels, or anything, they were all just appalled by these these suggestions. China does n not, uh, uh, Mauritius does not have that sort of a close relationship with China as it has with France in particular, the UK to a slightly lesser extent, and India and Australia. They have much, much closer relations, and they're highly, it's just inconceivable that they would set aside that. In any case, if you want to keep uh, Mauritius in the Western Alliance, 
the best and only way of doing that is ensuring that you have an agreement on the future of Diego Garcia. If you don't want to, then you drive, you possibly could drive a future government into the arms of China. Busman's holiday, David. What? <laughs> it was a busman's holiday, with David. <laughs> it was in Mauritius, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Right. Uh, just to clarify, so my submission said that the U.S. was more focused on the Pacific than the Indian Ocean. I agree that the South China Sea and Taiwan is a primary focus for China. It wasn't in the submission, but the Indian Ocean presence has grown dramatically in the last decade. Thank you. David, just before we move on, though, would you accept, though, that 20 years ago, none of us would have thought that Sri Lanka would essentially, in effect, lose its sovereignty to China? and that perhaps, therefore, the requirement of something that is such a fundamental security footprint for the UK and US, and you'd argue, therefore, for all of our allies and all of those that we show support to, it is important that we do ask these questions, even if they may be deemed to be offensive. Well, yes, I, I agree with you. Those questions should always be asked. Um, but I don't feel that I'm in a position to comment on our relationship with Sri Lanka uh, at any particular stage, because I've never been close to that. So I'm sorry, I don't feel that I'm an expert enough no, to answer I think it. none of us would have said 20 years ago that we expected Sri Lanka to lose its sovereignty. I think that was not really on the cards and devastatingly seems to be the situation that we are in at the moment. Dan. Thank you, Chair. David, could you tell us what you think the diplomatic challenges are uh, of the various court rulings and UN resolutions for yes. US and UK foreign policy? Well, I'm sad to say that the UK's reputation internationally uh, on the international stage and with uh, international courts and tribunals with the UN General Assembly and so on uh, is at its lowest ebb and one of the main reasons for that is the position we have taken on uh, the ICJ advisory opinion and uh, for as long as we stay in that uh, position we will not get British judges and experts elected to international courts or to expert bodies in the UN. It, it may come as a surprise to the members of the committee that there are 10 human rights treaty bodies in the UN. Britain used to be a member of almost all of them. We are no longer a member of any of them. There are 276 um, expert groups in the entire UN system. Britain used to have membership of many of them. We no longer have membership of any of them. Uh, now, that sends a very, very strong signal about what Britain's reputation, where Britain's reputation now stands. And we have a chance by respecting and implementing and agreeing with Mauritius the implementation of the ICJ advisory opinion and the UN General Assembly resolution which endorsed it uh, to redeem some of the UK's lost reputation. And I believe that the, 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 the issue of Chagos is absolutely fundamental to where Britain stands in the international um, situation. Our position on the Ukraine and on Palestine is greatly undermined uh, by our position on Chagos. In other words, we're saying that international law applies to Russia and it applies to Israel and other countries, but it doesn't apply to the UK in the case of If, if we don't agree, what do you see as consequences? Of well, the consequences will be a continuing deterioration in Britain's standing in the world. Um, and uh, it can only be reversed <clears throat> by um, being seen to implement... Uh, the decisions of international courts, not just the ICJ, but the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and the Arbitral Tribunal um, and various other courts. Dr Ladwick, how do you see the effect of this on reputational risk for the US? I think there are pockets of concern that are growing in the U.S. For the longest time, there was sort of a, uh, a bit of a, a, a hands-off approach of, you know, well, this is, um, this is something to be worked out between Mauritius and, and the U.K., you know, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with us. I think there are some who are starting to, to feel, as, as David said, that, that 
it kind of creates challenges for the U.S. Now, at this stage, I think it's still, for the United States at least, is, is largely in the realm of whataboutism. So people who are just looking at an excuse to deflect or looking at a reason to sort of pull it back will, will talk about something like this. I don't think it ever really comes up as a substantive point or a substantive issue. But as we've seen in this country, the way in which sort of uh, the issue has sort of grown and take on life, I, I would just conjecture that there'd be sort of a similar development over the next 20 years in, with respect to the U.S. If, if the issue is kind of not put to bed. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Ladwick, uh, uh, Mr. Snoxall. Thank you. This is a mess. It really is. And it's been a mess from day one. My concern has always been the welfare and the rights of the Shagossian people. And we're now in a situation whereby they have been dispersed to the UK, to Seychelles, to Mauritius. <clears throat> they don't seem to have a say in any of this. We're talking about uh, America, we're talking about the US, we're talking about Mauritius. I'm concerned about the rights of the Shagossian people. I believe it is possible that they can return and settle in the outer islands for certain. I've actually been there, and although it's remote and needs, needs a lot of infrastructure, do you believe that it's our, us, and Mr. Snox referred to um, our obligations and the legalities of all this, but do you not think we have a moral obligation, the United Kingdom, not, not another country. We were the country that ejected those people from their homeland in the first place. Surely it's our responsibility to give those people the right and their descendants the right to go back to, to live and to visit and to settle in their homeland. May I answer that? You, well, can, bo you can both answer Yes, that. indeed, indeed. Go but, ahead, uh, go if ahead. I could just go first. <clears throat> well, I agree entirely with you, Andrew. Um, I've always advocated, uh, right from when I first was involved in 95, uh, that the Shigosians should be allowed to return. Our biggest problem is, uh, and it sort of answers your question, is the fragmentation of the Shigosians. You have uh, up to nine Shigosian groups. When I was High Commissioner, we had three, and they took it in turns to demonstrate against the High Commission. Um, now, I've just been in Mauritius, and I've been talking to uh, the uh, Chagos Refugees Committee. I met them all one evening, and to Olivier Bonco. Uh, they, I'm afraid, do not agree with Shigosian voices, which they regard as a third or fourth generation group that has come about since 2020. They've been there since 1982. Uh, this is a, 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 it has always been a huge problem, and I have to say, sadly, that I think officials uh, in governments have exacerbated that division and fragmentation by siding with one group one at some stage and then another group and so it's gone on and it's very difficult for a government to decide I mean yes I fully accept that we have uh, there's a very very important moral dimension to this and we should make uh, resettlement possible and it nearly came about it could easily have come about in 2002 after the first feasibility study but the officials dealing with it uh, f felt that it was all too exhausting and wearing and all the rest of it and they um, brought in evidence that uh, was highly questionable. The, 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 the um, feasibility study was flawed from the start. It could have happened again in 2010 and in 2015 at various stages. There's never been a reason why we shouldn't have done an experimental resettlement on the outer islands uh, all sorts of reasons have been thrown up, including cost, which was always hugely exaggerated, as you know. So, um, yeah, I believe that uh, we should tomorrow uh, announce that we're withdrawing the Auditing Council uh, of 2004, which banned the Shigosians from returning to their homeland. 
Thank you. The only thing I really have to add to that, and you know, my view as an academic from the time I started following this and, and studying this issue, is I've never understood why the U.S. government can fly in and employ Filipino contractors to run dining facilities and other ancillary support things on uh, Diego Garcia and not upskill and train, if, if that's required, members of the community that would want to, to have those mm -hmm. roles. So even, you know, you, you can vet them, you can do security clearance, you can do whatever you need to do. I've never understood why that's never Well, the, the, there always have been Shigazians working on the base since 2006. The Americans do allow it. Uh, but they could do a great deal more to uh, help it. The reason why Shigozins don't want to work on the base is uh, the very low pay that they get, mm -hmm. that Filipinos get, and also they're not allowed to take their families with them. And for both those reasons, they don't want to work on the base. See, where I'm coming from on this, and I want to talk about the effects that the uh, United States, their military base, the Outer Islands, if, they, if the Shigozins are able to go back. Yeah. Where I'm coming from on, on this is that had the United Kingdom not removed those people from these islands in the first place, we wouldn't be having this debate. No, they'd be still there. Because every other British overseas territory, the inhabitants have a say about where they belong and where they want to be. So had they been allowed to stay there in the first place, as with Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands and all the other British overseas territories, mm -hmm. the people would still be living there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, there would be the, the rights, they would have the rights to have a say over the destiny of their territory. So can I ask Mr. Snoxall, who's to blame for this? Who, who, who decided, who decided, Mr. Snoxall, you served in the Foreign Office, mm. you, you, you know what's been going on all these years. Who is to blame for this catastrophic embarrassment by Her Majesty's government at the time? And who has been, who has been puppeteering the American view because I've been to Washington with this committee and have raised it at very high levels in the State Department. Nobody's ever said to me they objected to the Shagossians going right. back. But when I come back here and I raise it with foreign secretaries and ministers and civil servants and officials, they say the Americans object. And yet whenever I've raised it with them, they haven't objected. So who's been puppeteering this whole mess from day one? Uh, it has to be officials to start with and officials brief ministers and they make recommendations to ministers and ministers uh, then make decisions on the policy recommended. So, um, you know, ministers can't escape the responsibility. Uh, it's officials who write the briefs, however. And I think if you were to go back to um, almost colonial days, you, would, you will find that uh, the Foreign Office in the late 1960s, early 70s, was driven by uh, colonial zeal. And one of the reasons they wanted the islands depopulated, the Americans never asked for that. The Americans only asked for, uh, as they put it, a clean sweep of Diego Garcia. They never required or asked for the islanders to be removed from all the other islands. That was. British colonial zeal, which went ahead with that, and why? Because by doing it that way, having created an overseas territory, we could escape um, uh, observation and inquiry by the UN General Assembly and the uh, Special Committee of 24 on Decolonization, on which I sat in 1969. Uh, they, they escaped it completely. So, yeah, I have to admit that officials are, are largely to blame. However, in, the, in my own defence, may I say that when I was uh, Deputy Commissioner of the Islands between 95 and 97, I was n barely aware of what had happened to the Shigosians. That may seem strange to members of the committee, but it never came up in my time and it never went to ministers. We never put anything to ministers. There were just three officials working to me on Bayat and then the commissioner, my boss, um, and we made all the decisions without feeling the need to clear them with ministers. I, I think you're going down a dangerous route with telling us that. But I think, <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, okay. I've finally um, come back to um, Dr. Yes. Lad Ladwick. So, um, islands like uh, um, Peros Banas are quite a long way okay. from, from Diego Garcia. It's quite clear that there was never any valid reason uh, to depopulate those islands. 
so if we were, as uh, Mr. Snox was suggested, remove those orders in council, allow the Chagos, they couldn't clearly go back immediately because there isn't the infrastructure. But if we were to do morally the right thing and to start the process of making arrangements to allow them to go back, to decide if they choose to go back or a small settlement, at least to, to start with a small settlement, uh, how would that affect the Americans? Would they, would they support that? Would they assist with that? Clearly, it could only be done with their cooperation because Diego Garcia would be so pivotal in helping to re rebuild that community. Could we, do you think we could rely on the Americans to be enthusiastic about this? Uh, and, and, and why do we need to wait for some kind of agreement with Mauritius? Why can't we get on with this now? Why do we have to wait for the uh, you know, long drawn out discussions about how this is going to end and mm. no one knows where this will end? Surely our priority in the United Kingdom should be to put right the wrong mm. and to do everything we possibly can to start the process of allowing the Shagossians to begin to make their way back to their homeland. So I'd, I'd start by saying that I've had a very similar experience to you in the being told here that um, resettlement was, was an anathema to the U.S. position on this and then not ever been able to track down anyone in the U.S. government who would, who would tell me that position. Um, so I believe that if, if it was once upon a time, it no longer is, or if it never was, um, it is the case that the outer islands would be, um, you know, provided that they are economically sustainable and viable, would be possible. There would probably be some marginal increase in security costs to guard against whatever potential risks. Um, but I think, you know, again, particularly the Biden administration wants to do the right thing. They want the facility on a long-term secure basis, but they also want to do the right thing. It's not just one, it's both. Um, and I, I would think that that would fall under the do the right thing um, component of, of how they'd like to see this kind of ultimately settled. And we need to do this before the American election. Ideally. For obvious reasons. Thank you. Can I just, um, and, we, and we don't have very long, but there are just two more questions I, I, I want to put to you. So, Dr. Labvig, is the US pulling their weight when it comes to Diego Garcia? Because I can't help as I look at this. You know, they're refusing to help if it came to resettlement. They don't pay any costs in terms of the access they have. They pay no rent. They've, every time we ask them to engage with us in any way, they essentially say, well, that's all for the UK to do. And actually, we don't get necessarily, I would argue, although we benefit enormously from the security value of it, we're not equal partners in any way on the islands. So is the US pulling their weight? And then David, forgive me, and I'm not a legal expert, so I, I recognize this may sound bizarre, but there are no conversations in this entire discussion about Chagossian rule of the Chagos Islands. It's always either Mauritian rule or the UK rule yes. or the US leasing in some way. Why is there no discussion, given that the Chagossian people are so distinct from the Mauritian people and the treatment they receive in the Mauritian islands is not always what I think it should be, why, why, is they, why are they just missed out altogether? Shall I answer that, that part of your question first? Um, <clears throat> it, it, it is because, uh, as Anna Rossendale said, if we go back to uh, before, sorry, uh, before the uh, buyout was created in 1965, the, the people on the Chagos Islands, known as the Ilwa, as the same on the other islands that surround Mauritius, particularly Rodrigues, were part of Mauritius. And they are regarded in international law as basically being Mauritians of Chagosian origin today uh, and when it, when it comes to self-determination the ICJ and all other courts um, have decided that uh, self-determination applies to the entire people of Mauritius not just uh, the Chagosians themselves. Is that not wrong? No it may be well, you're saying is international law wrong by well, asking I'm, that question? Yeah, I mean, sometimes international law is wrong, which is why we have arbitration and we discuss things and we debate yeah. things and we well, take cases. So, but so far, international law has been uh, comprehensive on this particular issue. Do you agree with that? Because you're, you're clearly an advocate for the Chagossian people. I am most definitely. I, I really, no Chagossian well, that we met identified as being of Mauritian descent in any way, happy with the way Mauritius treats them or has treated their ancestors. There is no Mauritian descent. They're all peoples that came from 
uh, uh, they were taught, brought there by the French as slaves. They have a huge Creole population in Mauritius, or they came from India later on. Is that the point I'm making? So why is international law ignoring the fact that these people are not Mauritian by descent? Because that is what it says in the UN Charter, Article 76, uh, which we are all signed up to, and in many other areas. Um, well, I mean, could I just make the point also that uh, it was me in November 2000 that asked the Shigosians to come and see me. I had only been in the office six weeks, and it was me that told them that they could now return to the Chagas Islands uh, following the High Court judgment of November the 5th, 2000. And um, I believed in that at the time. And then later on, um, the Foreign Office was to override all that, our commitments to the Shigosians, uh, and um, use this parallel system of parliamentary government called the Privy Council and put through a Privy Council order, uh, which Jack Straw, of course, uh, appended his name to at the time, um, banning their, them returning. I mean, this was a, a colossal blow to all of us at the time that really wanted to see resettlement taking place. Thank you. Dr. Lovey, last word on my yeah, question. With respect to US. your question, um, yeah. so look, you could certainly construct an argument in an abstract sense that says the U.S. operations and costs and being there, you know, is its contribution and benefits. But from the narrow standpoint of the operations of the facility, um, there's a lot of free riding, right? It's, it's, um, it's the U.K. that bears the political cost. It's the U.K. that bears the financial cost. Now, there are other basing arrangements in Japan and in Korea in which the local government picks up some of the financial cost or has to deal with an unhappy population because Marines are flying jets late at night or early in the morning and things like that. So it's not unheard of, but um, you know, the, the simple answer to the question is, is no, it's probably not doing as much as it could do. And it, it, it's, it's convenient to allow the political slings and arrows to be directed this way rather than towards Washington. Brilliant. Well, thank you both ever, unless there's anyone else. Thank you both ever so much for your time this morning. Do you want to come along? No. No, uh, just, just, just one f final thing. Uh, I, I think that the all-party group, um, and, and Honourable Member for Islington North is here, was set, the all-party group was set up by, the, uh, by, by Jeremy. And I'd just like to say, and Henry is now chairing, I chaired it in the interim as well, uh, I think it's played a huge part in, in bringing this whole issue to the table and Absolutely. the cross-party nature of this. Um, so I think it's vital that the Foreign Affairs Committee now really make something of this because it is, I think, a, a huge stain on the way the United Kingdom has handled something so important has affected so many people in such a detrimental way. So I really hope that as a result of this committee being established by the FAC uh, that, that the government will be put under pressure to do the morally the right thing and to allow the Shagossian people their rights and to give them the opportunity to, to go home to where they originate from, which I think is just a basic right of, of all human beings. Yeah, we'll finish with the statement rather than question. I'm going to have to wrap us up there. I'm so sorry. Could I just have one word to what Andrew is saying? I mean 20 seconds. I'm sorry. We've got another panel. Uh, oh. 20 seconds. I agree entirely that the APPG yeah. has held the feet of... Uh, governments to the fire of Chagos okay. over the last 15 years. Thank you very much. Thank you both ever so much. Thank you. Order, order. Mm -hmm. Suspended. The proceeding is currently 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 suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently... Order, order. Welcome back to this hearing of the Foreign Affairs Committee on the British Indian Overseas Territories. Uh, we are moving now on to our second panel where we are joined by Professor Sands. Welcome, Professor Sands. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we would be grateful if you could kindly introduce yourself. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation uh, to the subcommittee. I am Philippe Sands. I'm Professor of Law at University College London. I'm a barrister at 11 King's Bench Walk. And since April 2010, I have been counsel for Mauritius on matters relating to Chagos, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity as an academic in this context. Brilliant, thank you. Can you start by setting out the political and legal implications of the 2019 ICJ uh, ruling, please? The advisory opinion determined that the excision of the Chagos Archipelago from the colony of Mauritius in 1965 was unlawful and that it has no legal effects. And it then determined that the United Kingdom must end its unlawful administration of the Chagos Archipelago forthwith. Three months after the advisory opinion, it went to the General Assembly, which voted by an overwhelming majority uh, I think only four countries supported the United Kingdom and the United States out of 200 or so in opposing the vote. The United Kingdom must leave by November 2019. It determined that the Chagos Archipelago is and has always been part of the territory of Mauritius. And it confirmed that all the Chagosians, and I've just been listening to the conversation, uh, who wish to go back have a right to return. That's very helpful. And can I ask, um, if... If ownership of the islands was to move back to Mauritius, would there be an obligation on the Mauritians to allow resettlement um, should administration be transferred to them? So just to be pedantic, it's not a question of ownership being transferred. The islands belong to Mauritius today and they have always belonged to Mauritius. And that is the view of pretty much every country in the world, except for the United Kingdom and the United States and uh, four others, a couple of whom have now changed their minds. Um, so, so the issue really is about the United Kingdom recognising the realities and then moving forward on that basis. The Mauritian position, ever since I've been involved, I listened to um, High Commissioner Snoxall, is exactly the same. Ever since I've been involved, for six, three successive governments of Mauritius, uh, has been that the Chagossians will be able to return. Uh, I mean, just to give you a, a very brief anecdote, uh, in 2015, Sir Anarud Jugnath, um, member of the English Bar, became Prime Minister for the third time. He was the last living um, person who had been at the Lancaster House meeting in 1965. And he, like his predecessor, Prime Minister Ram Gulam, and his successor son, uh, Pravin Jugnath, are all committed to the return of Chagossians and next generation Chagossians who wish to be able to return. And have they set out a plan for how they would do that and how it would be financed and the way in which it would function and the employment opportunities, the way of life, freedoms? Would, would it operate as a, as a devolved federal area? How would it operate? It, in, indeed, that is underway right now as we speak and has been ever since the advisory opinion. Indeed, the meeting uh, to, that's been taking place over three days 
in Mauritius right now is on environmental conservation, which is a very important issue and actually a matter on which the UK and Mauritius are in very close sync. Um, and that has included a discussion on resettlement and the balance between resettlement uh, and conservation. The Zoological Society of London is very actively involved in, in this meeting. In fact, it's co-hosting uh, the meeting, which I'm very pleased is the case. And so those conversations are absolutely actively underway. Of course, one of the big questions that we don't know is how many people would actually want to go back when push comes to shove. I mean, we're talking now, I think, of at least four generations. And so for the first generation, those who were forcibly deported, there are um, quite a few who say they want to go back. But of course, they are quite elderly now. Conditions will not be ideal. Um, I, I think quite a few will want to go back. I think the more interesting question is how many of the second, third and fourth generations, when push comes to shove, actually really want to go back. And, and do you foresee then, given how many, uh, how big the community is in the UK now, that, for example, those who would go back would rescind British citizenship, keep British citizenship? What's your expectation? Well, I, I mean, at, at this point in the United Kingdom, and in Mauritius, dual or triple nationality is not prohibited. And so I, there's no question of people being made to, you know, abdicate their one or other nationalities in order to go back as as far as I know. I mean, what would have to happen, it is quite interesting, is that um, the possibility of second and third generations who are not um, currently of Mauritian nationality, Mauritius will have to amend its immigration laws. This is an issue, of course, that the United Kingdom uh, has faced in terms of second and third generation individuals uh, being able to come and live in the United Kingdom. Um, and that obviously would have to happen. But Mauritius through it, its prime minister, has made very clear that it will do everything it can to make sure that it happens. Its stated policy is, if you want to be able to go back and you have a Mauritian connection, you, a Chagossian connection, you will be able to go back. Thank you. And before I turn to Andrew, um, in terms of the African Union, can you set out for us, please? So, Robert, please do come and join us. Um, could you set out for us, please, what is the view of the African Union on this dispute and what impact is it having on the UK's relationship with African Union nations? Well, the African Union has supported Mauritius from the get-go for more than 40 years now uh, in full, calling for full respect of the sovereignty of Mauritius over the entire entirety of its territory, including the Chagos archipelago, and there have been consistent resolutions. I think this may be the first time in history that every African country supported the resolutions at the General Assembly, referring the questions to the ICJ and then the subsequent question. There's absolute unity, and indeed, a, a um, decision a declaration has been adopted just in the last few days, encouraging both Mauritius and the United Kingdom to bring the negotiations which are underway to a hasty conclusion. So, very strong relationship. And I think, I mean, as you know, um, it's already been said. I mean, Britain's reputation in Africa is, has, has, has been damaged. I regret to say by what has happened. Um, I can explain that most clearly in an anecdote that was given to me recently by an ambassador of South Africa um, in Belgium, who explained to me how he and his colleagues had been approached in relation to Ukraine-Russia situation uh, and uh, invited to assist the United Kingdom and the United States in removing Russia from its illegal occupation of parts of Ukraine, uh, an activity, of course, that I'm strongly supportive of. Uh, and they were met with the response, well, that's interesting. Let's see if we've understood this. You who are currently illegally occupying a part of Africa are asking us to help you remove another country from its illegal occupation of Ukraine. We don't think so. You need to get your house in order. So this is a very real issue. But can I ask then, Professor Sands, because we get told this repeatedly, that it's caused enormous reputational damage. And yet, as a committee last year, we were in South Africa, Mozambique, I was in Somalia, I was in Ethiopia, crucially. I had bilats with six further African countries, and not one of them has ever raised this, despite us talking to them about Ukraine, despite us talking about Israel, Gaza, everything else. It does seem slightly odd that not in one of our, I'd say, 12-plus engagements with African countries has it ever been yeah. raised with us. Well, I mean, I, I fully respect that that is your uh, situation. That has not been my situation. I suspect if you were to raise it, uh, it would come up. I think the, the proof is in the voting. I mean, if we take one example, to my great regret, um, Britain lost for the first time in history, for the first time in 100 years, its judge at the International Court of Justice. And in large part, 
that was because of the position on the Chagos Archipelago. It followed the resolution in the General Assembly, uh, and all the African countries basically, for the first time, failed to support uh, a, a UK candidate. So I, I don't think there's any inconsistency in our positions. If I don't raise it, people don't raise it with me. The moment it comes up, it produces a very strong reaction. So I don't think there's an inconsistency in the positions. But you did just acknowledge that it's when you bring it up that it comes out as a core issue. Whereas, I, I, you know, when we travel to different countries, we know exactly what the issues are we want to raise with these countries. We have a list of 12, 20 issues, and obviously we have to prioritise. But it, it, it does seem slightly odd that it's not being raised proactively with us. And maybe that's where I bring you in, Sir Robert. Um, thank you ever so much for joining us. We know you were chairing your committee uh, yes. this morning as well. Thank you. And it's good to see Philippe online. Brilliant. Well, um, but it's lovely to be with you again. Thank you. Uh, maybe not quite in the same situation. Yeah. But, uh, so, Robert, do you think it's worth... Uh, is this a storm worth weathering for the strategic advantages that Diego Garcia gives us? And do you agree in terms of the reputational impact uh, that has happened to the UK as a result of our position on Diego Garcia? Well, look, I, I hear what Philip says, and we can't ignore uh, observations of other countries, but I do feel strongly that, strategically, this is right for the United Kingdom to still maintain its presence in the British Indian, uh, overseas Indian Ocean Territory, the Chagos Islands. Uh, I, I think that um, uh, there are a couple of things going on here. Um, uh, there's been a sustained uh, campaign by Mauritius over the years to uh, use legitimate international forums to raise their objections to and concerns about this issue. Uh, of course, that's not always been the case. Uh, I'm not going to rehearse the arguments that Philippe and I had back in the ICJ in 2018, but uh, the evidence is the evidence, and it remains the case that, uh, uh, should we say, that uh, minds and um, opinions developed over time with regard to Mauritius' attitude towards the Chagos, to the extent that now it's become not just uh, an international campaign, but also through their use of domestic criminal law becoming quite a, a worrying trend uh, 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 there to, if you like, stifle and prevent legitimate debate about the future of the archipelago. Um, I, I think the extraterritorial uh, uh, reach of, of the new legislation that's been passed by Mauritius is deeply worrying. This committee should be rightly concerned about attempts to criminalise legitimate debate and questions about Mauritius' claim to Biot. Uh, I do not think that their claim is merited. Uh, the ICJ's uh, um, uh, uh, judgment was advisory. Uh, th this is in effect a bilateral dispute um, and I think that the way to deal with it is indeed through political negotiation. Now I think some clarity from the UK government is necessary with regard to their intention here. Um, we had the statement last year from the then Foreign, Foreign Secretary, um, differing um, noises perhaps emanating now. Um, simply this is a political dispute. Uh, this is not, I think, of a degree or nature that should uh, serve to inhibit or undermine the United Kingdom's work in other vital areas. And as you say, it is not being proactively raised in a, in a way that I think should cause us uh, the gravest of concern. Um, uh, and therefore, um, I think we need to put this issue in its proper context. This is an issue about uh, international security and defence, uh, prime first and foremost, uh, uh, and therefore, I think that it's it's now um, in danger of achieving a status that it does not deserve, mainly engineered, I'm afraid, by the activities of the Mauritian government. Thank you. Henry actually wants to bring up that exact issue with you, so I'm going to go to Henry. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sir Robert. Actually, I'd like to put that question uh, to uh, Professor Sands. Uh, we've just heard uh, about the uh, Mauritian law where questioning sovereignty um, is... Um, a criminal offence, uh, indeed has extraterritorial um, extent uh, to that law. So if I, in this uh, forum uh, or anywhere else, writing in an article were to say the Chagos Islands are under British sovereignty and should remain under British sovereignty, uh, if I then subsequently travelled uh, to Port Louis, um, I could be arrested, couldn't I? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Um, and I fear that uh, Sir Robert and the drafters of the report that he wrote forward to really 
haven't read the law very carefully. I was involved in the drafting uh, of the law. Um, you probably know, uh, Mr. Smith, I, I was former president of English Pen for five years. I'm a passionate believer in freedom of expression, and no one who expresses those kinds of views that, you know, Chagos or Bart or whatever you want to call it, uh, belongs to X, Y, or Z, would be prosecuted. What the law was intended to do and what it does is criminalize under the law of Mauritius anyone who purports to engage in certain activity, issuing coins, issuing official maps, doing scientific research on the territory of Mauritius. And the United Kingdom has got exactly the same provisions. If someone in Mauritius were to start issuing coins for the United Kingdom, you and I would be the first in saying, you can't do that. If someone in Mauritius were to authorize uh, scientific research on the territory of the United Kingdom, the British government would say, you can't do that. And if they persist in doing it, it would be referred to prosecutors. So there's an absolute balance in the situation. And the situation changed after 2019, when the United Nations and the General Assembly and subsequently the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea recognized or confirmed that uh, Chagos is part of the territory of Mauritius. So all that law does is prohibit and then criminalize activity which is official activity supported by a third state. So if you want to say the kinds of things you want to say, you're perfectly entitled to say it under Mauritian law and English law. It's, it's been misunderstood and misconstrued, and I think willfully, frankly, by the drafters of that report. So your, I understand um, from your introduction at an environmental conference um, at the moment um, in uh, Mauritius, uh, and uh, there will be um, uh, potentially uh, people who are involved in uh, the administration of the marine protected area um, that the United Kingdom established uh, in the, the late 2000s um, over the Chagos uh, archipelago. Um, if um, somebody is engaged in administering uh, that marine protected area on behalf of the United Kingdom, um, they would be committing an illegal act uh, according to Mauritius. It, it, indeed, just as it would be in relation to uh, the opposite situation. It, in fact, there are a very, I think there are about 85 people at this workshop. A, a great number are from the United Kingdom, uh, and they engage in scientific research in the Chagos Archipelago, and they now do so through the Zoological Society of London and other universities, precisely because they've asked uh, authorization from Mauritian authorities to be able to do it. And of course, Mauritius has said, absolutely, you're welcome to carry out your scientific research. We support uh, what you have done in the past, and we support your continued uh, activity. And they are here, and they, I can assure you, none of them have been arrested, and none of them will be arrested. Uh, Sir Robert, uh, continuing um, on this, uh, on this uh, theme, yes. um, is your understanding of the Mauritian uh, law uh, just restricted, as uh, Professor Sands uh, is uh, suggesting, uh, to things like issuing stamps and coins? and well, uh, or, or, or is it actually having um, a, uh, an effect of depressing free speech uh, when it comes to the issue of uh, sovereignty um, over the, over the Chagos Islands. I think context is everything here. And if Philippe was talking about the passage of this legislation after this issue had been fully resolved, that might be another matter entirely, but it's not. Um, I, I'm delighted to hear that uh, we have oceanographers and researchers carrying out important work in a protected maritime area uh, uh, and then talking to the Mauritians about it. They don't, they don't need the permission of the Mauritian authorities to do that. Uh, this is still an unresolved issue at the very least. And, and I would say that the passage of this legislation is, to put it politely, premature. Um, it can only, in the context of this ongoing issue, send a message, I'm afraid, from legislators and the government of Mauritius that they are hostile to any further discussion of this matter and that um, it would be a bit be, uh, uh, like, uh, I suppose, the United Kingdom after the independence of the Republic of Ireland deciding to produce maps, currency and other documents that somehow incorporated the Republic into the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom. 
uh, clearly wrong, inappropriate, uh, an insertion of domestic law into a fiercely contested issue, an issue in fact that had been resolved in favour of the Irish Republic, and therefore the context, I'm afraid, is important, and the message that has been sent has been one that has been <coughs> chilling, and that is why I thought the report was uh, a necessary, I thought it was uh, a timely intervention, uh, and a reminder that we all have a responsibility to look at the context within which we pass legislation, as well as the precise wording of it. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, good morning, uh, Sir Robert, Professor Sands. As you will know, the United Kingdom is responsible for 21 different territories, uh, some of which are overseas territories, some of which are crown dependencies. Now, if a precedent was set over the British Indian Ocean Territory and the sovereignty of those islands were to be handed over to Mauritius without the consent of the people of the Chagos Islands, notwithstanding the fact that they're not actually living on those islands, that we have a very clear principle of self-determination, do we not? If we didn't do so, wouldn't that be a breach of that principle? Maybe uh, Professor Sands would like to go first. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Now, can I just come in, though, just, I will answer that straight away, but just in response to Sir Robert, who says the matter is not resolved. I'm afraid, Sir Robert, I think, as you well know, it is resolved as a matter of international law. 28 international judges and arbitrators have now had a chance to express a view on this matter, and not one has supported the British claim. Uh, 23 have made clear Chagos belongs to Mauritius, and the other five have expressed no view about it because it doesn't fall within their jurisdiction. The International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea determined that the maritime boundary of Chagos is between Mauritius and the Maldives, and that was because the UN... Uh, and the ICJ had definitively resolved the dispute. There is no claim, there is no legal issue. It's gone, it belongs to uh, Mauritius. But in relation to Mr. Rosendahl's question, and it comes back to uh, a point I think made by the chair, how does the law of self-determination work? And, and it, it is certainly the case that there is confusion in sort of public discourse, and that's understandable. The way international law works, and Mr. Snoxell explained it, is that the right to self-determination accords principally to a population within a recognised state. Uh, and so, for example, if the people of Scotland wish to exercise self-determination and gain independence, under international law, they cannot do that unless the United Kingdom as a whole has given them the right to so do. The same thing happens with Quebec. You remember when Quebec wanted to secede from Canada, the Canadian Supreme Court applied international law and said you can't do that unless the Canadian Parliament allows you to do that, and the Canadian Parliament has not allowed you to do that. It's exactly the same in relation to Mauritius and Chagos. Chagos was found by the International Court of Justice to be a part of the former colony of Mauritius for more than 150 years, and on that basis, it is for the people of Mauritius as a whole to determine who governs the Chagos Archipelago. Now, if the government of Mauritius wants to say, we hand it over to the Chaosians to run, that's a matter for the government of Mauritius. But it hasn't done that. And until it does that, the right of self-determination vests not in a part of the population of Mauritius or the United Kingdom or Canada, but on all of the population. And that's why, warts and all, the law on self-determination applies in that way. There are critiques of how it works, but the United Kingdom, for obvious reasons, is a very strong supporter I of that kind of... Professor right Sands, now. you should know that Quebec is part of Canada. The British overseas territories are not part of the United Kingdom. So it's a very different situation. You're talking about a part of a nation state separating from that nation state. Uh, the colleagues here will know that the British Indian Ocean Territory have no representation in this parliament, they are effectively oh. a colony. So I, I would say to you, uh, do you not believe in decolonization and allowing those who are being decolonized the right to make their own decisions about where they with, belong? With the greatest respect, you're, you're, you're proceeding on the same misapprehension of the legal situation as Sir Robert. The British Indian Ocean Territory doesn't exist in international law. It exists in British law. It no longer is recognised under international law. The Chagos Archipelago has been determined 
definitively, authoritatively, and permanently as a matter of law to be part of Mauritius. So very frankly, what the United Kingdom wants in relation to the Chagos Archipelago is in a sense neither here nor there. So, uh, it's I not want Sir Robert to come in because act. he's not had a chance. So can I, before I, I say that, surely the precedent you're setting therefore is if the ICJ decided that the Falkland Islands, to give an example, uh, were not actually uh, belonging to the United Kingdom, they weren't sovereign to the United Kingdom, the ICJ can make these kind of rulings, you're effectively saying that one by one, territories can all be separated no, and taken I'm, away. That's I'm, what you're I'm really not, saying. I think, we're bringing, I'm, I'm I think we're bringing in Sir Robert at this point. Please. Sorry, sorry to disagree with my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Sands. Um, th this has not been resolved. It is the, the use of the ICJ to resolve what was a bilateral dispute. It is, I'm afraid, not an appropriate use of that court. It is an advisory opinion. This is a bilateral dispute between now the United Kingdom and Mauritius. That is why we've heard noises about negotiation. And clearly in the context of that, the views of the Chagossians become very, very important. I mean, the history of this is a sad one. Uh, it's a very sad one for those uh, people from the, that archipelago who left, uh, who didn't want to leave, and who were made to leave, and for whom a reparation has rightly been paid. And we, we, we forget, don't we, if, we, if we have these sort of high arcane arguments at a certain level, we're forgetting about the fact there are real lives involved here in people's views. And that's why I'm afraid you can't separate out the way in which we approach the British Indian Ocean Territory, uh, an overseas territory of the United Kingdom, and the other responsibilities we have for other overseas territories. You can't pick and mix uh, 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 and take a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a bespoke approach to each area. We owe a duty, I think, to get this right. And self-determination has to be a part of that. This is a delicate matter. This isn't... Um, some sort of 19th century argument where the United Kingdom is seeking to impose its view. It's re a reflection of the, the difficult history of this archipelago, um, the resistance, the proper resistance to a specious claim to it by Mauritius, uh, and the res resolution of what is a dispute that needs to be dealt with politically use the ICJ in this way and, and to allow this to become a precedent, I think does no service to that important tribunal whatsoever. Professor Sands. Well, I mean, I think you've heard what I said. Um, the, uh, coming back to Mr. Rosendell's question, of course you should ask yourself the question, what is the precedential consequence, if any, of the decision of the International Court or the outcome of the future negotiations? And the answer, very simply, is none, because the Chagos Archipelago is in a category of one in its situation. It is the only one of the overseas territories which was excised from a former British colony. And that was the only reason the International Court of Justice could exercise the jurisdiction that it did. So the Falkland Islands, Gibraltar, Cyprus, they are all completely different situations. They are not decolonization situations like Mauritius. They were not cut off from another part of a former colony. And that's why they don't go to the International Court of Justice. They are situations that are factually and juridically different. And it, it, it's very troubling to hear a sort of mixing up of apples and oranges in this way, because the facts of each overseas territory are particular and must be recognised as particular. Well, of course, uh, the Cayman Islands uh, were part of Jamaica, and they did decide uh, to separate from Jamaica when Jamaica became independent. But, of course, the people there decided that. Uh, and what you're saying, Professor Sands, is that the, the value of the Chagossians is zero. Their views are zero. But can other, I come ter in other territories yeah. uh, can have a say. So there is an example of part of a previous colony uh, which has separated and remained a British overseas territory. Just to, uh, to, to end up, Sir Robert, the implications for... United Kingdom and our 21 different territories that we still have ultimate responsibility for. What would be the implications for this if this went ahead without the Chagossian people having any say whatsoever? Well, I think disturbing, and I, I think that uh, it doesn't give any 
uh, encouragement to Indigenous peoples in other parts of the world that their voices will indeed be heard. This is 2024, not uh, 1824, and the voices of uh, the inhabitants of our overseas territories are of paramount importance. You know, the idea that the United Kingdom just wants to cling on to bits of the world because we want pink bits on the map belongs in the archives. This is all about now our responsibilities, historic though they might be, to uh, real people and real communities living in these areas now. And that is why, having worked extensively when I was Solicitor General with uh, fellow uh, attorneys and solicitors and law officers from other overseas territories, I gained a very useful understanding of the nature of that responsibility. And that's why I think in the case of Biot, we have to, I'm afraid, hold firm and be very clear that uh, uh, to separate out this particular case as... Professor Sam suggests, and to say that it's sui so generis, is, I think, not right. Uh, and therefore, we, will, we, we should, I feel strongly, maintain our stance with regard to this territory. Uh, and to, to remind the world that there, there isn't any uh, you know, long-term absolute must for the United Kingdom to remain in possession uh, and responsibility for Biot. But at the moment, uh, bearing in mind uh, everything that I see... I do not think that those criteria are met uh, and that whilst political negotiation is, in, is entirely uh, in order, if, that, if respective governments want to do that, that is the forum to resolve these matters, not by using the ICJ in this way. Uh, Fabian. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sir Robert, what are the legal implications of the ruling by the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea that the coastline of the Chagos Islands is Mauritian. And does that tribunal ruling pose challenges to the UK in terms of enforcement of the marine protect protection area and effective control over the islands? Well, look, I, th I think the, the, the ruling is significant. Uh, I think in many ways it is more significant than the ICJ advisory opinion in 2018 uh, because it relates to a hard and fast issue relating to the coastline, which is probably why... Uh, the Foreign Office was influenced to uh, start to seek to discuss and negotiate uh, the matter. Now, that's a real politique. That, that's an aspect of international law that clearly is relevant. But to say that that is determinative of an important issue of fundamental sovereignty is, I think, to overstate the matter, uh, which is why uh, I, when, when I heard what Professor Sam said about permission being given for oceanographers to, to enter the, the marine area, uh, I don't think it's strictly necessary, but I certainly think the dialogue and discussion with, with the government in Mauritius is entirely appropriate. So, like everything, the situation continues to evolve, and I would say that judgment was an element in it that, 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 that uh, the UK government does have to have regard to. Professor Sands, do, would you agree with that? Well, I, 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 I think it is determinative. It's a binding judgment between Mauritius and the Maldives. It has changed the world maps of the International Maritime Organization uh, and, other, and, and other entities, and it is absolutely dispositive. In order to be able to delimit the maritime boundary, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea went through an exercise of assessing the authority and effect of the International Court's advisory opinion, and it concluded that it was dispositive. It said, in terms, the UK has no right to sovereignty. It doesn't even have a claim to sovereignty. It's over, it's resolved. And that was a unanimous judgment of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So as a matter of international law, it, it's over. The issue now, realistically, is for two countries, Mauritius and the United Kingdom, which are really good allies. I listened to the previous panel with great interest. I mean, the idea that Mauritius would go off and cut a deal with um, another country, China, is just extraordinary for us to hear. I've worked for the government of Mauritius for 15 years. It's clear that Mauritius's closest ally is India. The idea that Mauritius would do such a thing is, is just not going to happen. The issue now is to resolve the long-term security of the base. And Mauritius has made absolutely crystal clear the base stays and continues to operate exactly as it has operated since it was first established. The second issue is the return of the Chagossians. The third issue is conservation of the environment. And it thrills me, frankly, that 
British and Mauritian scientists are working together to take forward that protection. So this is a sort of win-win-win situation for everybody. And my fervent personal hope is that the negotiations produce a sensible outcome so that everyone can just move on from these issues and deal with much more significant matters. Can I come back to you, Sir Robert? Because some legal experts have criticised the ICJ for giving an opinion on a bilateral dispute, and we've, we've already exercised this this afternoon. Without the agreement of both parties, that the opinion has been incorrectly used subsequently. Now, I know you, the, both our panel members disagree about this, but are these legitimate complaints, do you think, according to the mandates of the ICJ and ITLOS? And does this change the value and effects of the judgment? Well, well entirely. I mean, I was you know, candid about the, the differing nature of the international the tribunal, the law, the sea uh, judgment, and the binding nature of it. Uh, I have to make that concession. But I'm afraid, you know, the p- primary argument that we lodged with the ICJ was that uh, this was not a suitable issue to, uh, to uh, result in an opinion from them because this was a, a, um, a bilateral sovereignty dispute. Um, this was not a, a dispute that we consented to resolve. Remember that where you have the, these important and useful and vital international tribunals, the consent of parties is, lies at the heart of it so that we can resolve issues. We're talking here about two democracies um, are, are entirely able by consent to negotiate and to disagree where appropriate, perhaps not to resolve or, or to resolve. And, and for the court then to have ended up, in effect, inserting itself in this way because one party wanted it and the other one didn't, I, I thought uh, was wrong. Uh, it flew against the evidence. The advisory opinion, when you read it, bears no relation at all to the submissions or the evidence that was put before it. The British government, the British uh, 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 representations that I helped lead, Uh, contained a whole litany of documents, cabinet minutes and other documents going right back to the 60s that were the only available record of what happened. Now, some of those documents didn't reflect very well on the British government. Some of the phraseology in the documents was not good. It was embarrassing. Uh, Some of the conduct of the British government was embarrassing and merited an apology to the court. But we were frank and full in our disclosures, and I'm afraid... That evidence did not show in any way mm-hmm. the uh, consistent line of, of argument that the Mauritians sought to, to, to put. They didn't consider this issue as in any way relevant or important until the 1980s. This was not even on the table in the 1960s. Whatever one can say about alleged mm-hmm. inequalities of bargaining power, which you know I can accept in, a, in an era of colonialism you can say exist, uh, even taking all of that into account, I, I fail to see uh, that this judgment, not following the evidence, uh, which is advisory, should then be allowed to, uh, if you like, build a political campaign. And I'll say this, the courts are there to resolve matters of law and interpretation and, where parties consent, to resolve disputes. They should not be used as a vehicle for political campaigning. And this is what has happened in this case, a sustained campaign by one country to use valid and important tribunals to establish a specious claim. And finally, Professor Sands, and I'm sorry we've almost run out of time, but I'd just insert one, uh, one more comment, and that is, where is the voice of the Chagossians in all this? Well, the voice, yes, indeed. I'm very grateful to you for asking that because here I am sitting in Mauritius. I've broken out from the workshop, 85 people here, about 15 or 20 of them uh, are are, are Mauritians. And we're sitting around in a room talking about uh, the conservation of the environment, traditional knowledge of the Chagossians to ensure that the conservation arrangements are fully taken into account, something the UK didn't do in 2010. The plan is for me, an Professor assessment... Sands, of... You've just said that 15 yeah. of the Mauritians. Are any of them Chagossians? Sorry, Chag- I meant Chagossians. I'm so sorry. I meant Chagossians. Okay. There are many more Mauritians. Uh, I'd say probably about 35 people out of the total are Mauritian and about 15 are Chagossians. Mr. Bancou is here. Many of his colleagues are here. And the discussion is on a conservation Uh, arrangement in which they are fully involved in its design and its implementation and the next assessment mission to Chagos is being prepared 
they will be on that mission and they are going to go back and resettle. And I have to say, I listened uh, to, to Sir Robert plead for the Chagossians, but I mean, United Kingdom had 50 years to get them back uh, to Chagos. Mauritius has acted within a couple of years of the advisory opinion and the return is now, I think, foreseen. Brilliant. I'm Thank afraid you. with that we're going to have to wrap up uh, because we have three minutes into Prime Minister's questions. Uh, but we thank you both ever so much for making the time and coming to see us. You, of course, very welcome to send us further written evidence, should you wish. And with that, I conclude the session. Order, order. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.